Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of the Thrive with Asbury Seminary podcast, where we bring you conversations with authors, thought leaders, and people just like you who are looking to connect where your passion meets the world's deep need. Today, I talked to Mr. Shane Claiborne, speaker, activist, and best-selling author. Shane worked with Mother Teresa in Calcutta and founded The Simple Way in Philadelphia. He heads up Red Letter Christians, a movement of folks who are committed to living as if Jesus meant the things he said. Shane is a champion for grace, which has led him to jail advocating for the homeless and to places like Iraq and Afghanistan to stand against war. Now, Grace fuels his passion to end the death penalty and help stop gun violence. Shane has written many books, which we'll link to in the show notes, but his most recent book is Beating Guns. In today's conversation, Shane and I talk about what it means to live as if Jesus meant the things he said. Shane also shares his perspective on politics and gives some ways he believes Christians can engage in the political arena and offers advice for how we can maintain friendships when we encounter people who think differently than we do. We also talk about ways to love our neighbor and his work with The Simple Way. Let's listen. As I was preparing for our interview today, I was thinking about Um, I believe you spoke at Asbury University. I don't even remember when, but I was a student there. And one of my friends remembers it even more vividly than I do because she said you walked out on stage, did a backflip, and then preached your sermon. And that changed her life. She's since gone on to work in India, do some mission trips in Africa. But I was just curious, is a back is a backflip normally part of your entrance? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I can't recall if that is true or not. I can neither confirm oh, okay. or deny that that happened, but I, can, <laughs> okay. I thought you were going to say she went on to become a gymnast or something, but uh, no. you know, I, I will, I will say this, Heidi, I was a, uh, the Tennessee state state champion in gymnastics uh, a, a very, very long time ago. So I, I, and at 40, what am I? 45 years old, I can still do a backflip, but I'm not going to ask you, you better not ask me to do it in chapel tomorrow. Okay. (laughs) That's awesome. That is so cool. After 40, I have to stretch for like an hour before I'm ready to pull that off these days. But (laughs) yeah, I, I get that. I didn't do gymnastics when I was younger, but always wanted to. And so I started doing gymnastics as an adult. So like early thirties. And let me tell you, it, I don't know what it's like in your younger years, but I was just like, I hurt all over. So I finally gave it up. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's you got to get the young people's attention somehow. So a backflip and then preach the word. That's kind of how I roll. I'm also a fire breather, Heidi. So I, I can bust that out sometimes too. The fire, Are you really? fire breathing. Yeah. I went to circus school. So I uh, am a little... Uh, a little rusty on some of my circus skills, but my juggling and unicycling and but my fire breathing's in pretty good shape. I've done that. Uh, I've kept that that you know intact. It comes that in handy is, a lot of places. I would imagine that gets people's attention for sure. <laughs> the world the yeah. world needs a little more circus, especially right now. I think. Well, you could also argue that we're in a circus, but we need a fun circus. So. <laughs> One could argue. We've got our own clowns going on right now. Yep. We we do on both sides. Um, but after you do your backflip or breathe or breathe fire, um, you're known for talking about living what it means to live as if Jesus meant what he said. Um, so what does that mean to you? Yeah. So for me, you know, I, I shared a little bit this morning in the chapel in the seminary, but I grew up in Tennessee, fell in love with Jesus. And then I, it became very clear to me that the church is better at making believers than forming disciples. And and by that, mm-hmm. I mean, we're, you know, sometimes we worship Jesus, but we don't always do the things he said. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because Jesus said, like, sell what you have and give it to the poor. He said, you know, live like the lilies and the spar- sparrows. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't stockpile. You know, don't. Said, I don't know what that means for a 401k plan, but I, I have a hunch. You know, that, that got, you know, this idea that we're to hold our possessions with open hands, we're to love our enemies, the call to nonviolence, to enemy love. These things really be- began to challenge me. Uh, and 
I also saw the the contradictions in the church. You know, it wasn't that long ago that the Barna Research Group went to every state in the U.S. and they asked young non-Christians, what do you think of when you hear the word Christian? And what they found is just heartbreaking. The number one answer of what non-Christians said, uh, young non-Christians, was uh, anti-gay, anti-homosexual. Number two oh, wow. uh, was judgmental, and number three was hypocritical. And, and you know, I'll stop there because the list is is not uh, very good. And and what it showed me too is that we have often. Um, not been known for the very thing that Jesus said they will know that we are Christians by, which is love. And so Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of us that see that one of the biggest obstacles to Christ is Christians, you know, who have a whole lot to say with our mouths, but we we don't always um, show God's love very well in our communal lives and in our own lives. So, you know, I've been working at the, I'm not here to judge everybody else. I'm working at the the log in my own eye, as, as Jesus said, you know, but <laughs> yeah. I wanted, you know, I wanted to live with less and less contradictions. I wanted to try to follow Jesus and not just believe in him and, and really see this as our faith as not just a way of believing, but a way of living in the world. Yeah. So how, once you started coming to this realization, how did that go on and change your life? Well, I, I, so as I leaned into Jesus, I felt like I wanted to uh, find some people who could point me in the right direction, you know, and I, there are a lot of great saints all through history. You know, I loved St. Francis and Dorothy Day and uh, Oscar Amaro and Dr. King. There's all these great folks, but they, you know, they, they've all passed on to the other side. And, and yet Mother Teresa was still alive when I was in college. And so a group of my college friends and I wrote her a letter and we ended up going over to work with her in India. And she's one wow. of those people that like, you know, put flesh on things for me. When, when, you, when you say who's someone that has um, lived out the gospel, she is one of those that uh, gave it a pretty good go, you know. And so I worked with her. Uh, I went over, you know, a couple of times to India. But she's um, I, I've come to really believe that the gospel spreads not by force, but by fascination, you know, that we're to love people in ways that fascinate people with the goodness of God. And she's certainly one of the people that did that. So, you know, I, I after being in India, um, I, ironically, one of the things that Mother Teresa would say is uh, Calcuttas are everywhere if we'll only have eyes to see. So oh, wow, find yeah. your Calcutta. You know, you don't have to go across the world to follow Jesus. So we came back to Philadelphia, and that's when we started our community. And, okay. you know, we, we've been at it for 25 years now. Wow. I didn't realize it was that long. So tell us about... <laughs> yeah, I didn't, that I'm that old. Is that what you're no, saying? No, that is not. No. I just meant, I didn't realize it had been going on for that many years. So tell us about the simple way and how that got started. Well, it... it when I was in college, uh, r- right uh, in the middle of our undergraduate work, there was a group of homeless mothers and children, homeless families that didn't have anywhere to go. Um, and they found an old abandoned Catholic cathedral on the north side of Philadelphia, and they moved into this abandoned church. And we heard about it in the news. And actually the headline article said church resurrected. And it talked about how this old Catholic building had been abandoned for years. And these families had brought it back to life and they were actually holding worship services. They were living in there. You know, they were trying to figure out what was next for them. And sadly, the Catholic uh, archdiocese that owned the building said that they were trespassing and that they would be arrested if they didn't get out of there. And, um, And so the families hung a banner on the front of it that said, how can we worship a homeless man on Sunday and ignore one on Monday? Oh, wow. (laughs) Yeah. That, that, you know, that really sparked um, the student movement of solidarity. Uh, I mean, I don't know how big Asbury is, but our our college at Eastern University was just about at the time, about a thousand students on campus and almost a hundred of us ended up getting involved with these families. Some of us almost moving into the cathedral, you know, in solidarity with the families, risking arrest, you know, really trying to um, encourage the the church, the Catholic church to make a different decision. And that ended up happening. They stayed there for months and months and uh, many of them got housing 
And that, you know, out of that little student movement, we started the simple way. We read about the early church in the book of Acts, and we were inspired to uh, try to, uh, you know, hold our possessions in common, uh, to live simply. And, and that's where our name came from, you know, this, this idea that we're to live simply so that others can simply live. So we committed ourselves to try to live um, uh, and, and also to, to see our faith, not just as something that is, you know, a worship service on Sunday morning, but something we're to live out, you know, uh, all, all the other days of the week. So we, we often say that the gospel's lived out of dinner tables and living rooms. It's lived in the streets. You know, it's lived outside of our church buildings as much as inside. So we, you know, over the last 25 years, we've been forming this little village. And so now we have a, a, a cluster of houses, about a dozen different properties, community gardens, murals, uh, all kinds of stuff going on in the neighborhood. Even in the pandemic, we've we've um, yeah. been trying to do some, you know, trying to love our neighbors. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up the pandemic. I feel like it's ever present these days. How has that affected your work with The Simple Way? Well, it's, it's been, you know, like, like everywhere, it's been an interesting season where we've, um, our prayer is that we would be both courageous and cautious, you know, that we would be, you know, careful, but also that we wouldn't let fear stop us from loving our neighbors and, and especially those who are really vulnerable. We've got tons of friends who live on the streets. So the stay at home orders are not really uh, possible. If they, if you don't have a home, there's a lot of folks that are, um, Home's not a safe place if they're in domestic violence. So we're trying to be, you know, really attentive to those that are especially vulnerable. And I think the pandemic has also like surfaced some of the already existing inequalities, you know, the way that it's um, disproportionately affecting uh, folks that are African-American, people of color, folks that are in poverty, that don't have health care. Uh, you know, so I, I, it's been said that when America catches a cold, African-Americans catch pneumonia. And I, you know, I think that's kind of what we see in many of our vulnerable communities. I've got a lot of friends that are in prison. So I'm thinking of them trying to write them letters because many of them can't have any visitors right now. So the pandemic's bad enough, but if you imagine living in a a, a little six foot, you know, eight eight foot jail cell and can't see your kids or family for months and months and months, it's a, uh, uh, you know, it, its own kind of um, of horror as well. Yeah, yeah. I feel like it's been hard on everybody, but it's been especially hard on those who are already on the margins and overlooked on a regular basis anyway. Yeah, and one of the cool things, though, is it's brought a lot of us together. And my neighbors are the heroes in this. They're the ones that uh, <laughs> I've been away from Philly, um, visiting some family down here for a bit. But, you know, we're, we at times during the pandemic, we've been feeding with a coalition of folks in Philly, five or six hundred people a day. And so it's brought a wow. lot of people together, delivering food bags to seniors. You know, we got uh, cliff bars, you know, those l- granola bar yes. things. They gave us 10,000 cliff bars. <laughs> no <laughs> so, way. But that's kind of <laughs> handy when kids don't have school lunches, you know? Yeah. And I mean, uh, so we, you know, we, we just been doing what we can and, uh, I'm, I'm really, uh, pumped to see, you know, as it's, as someone said on the dark, in the darkest nights, you see the brightest stars. And I see, we, we, we see a lot of really, um, courageous, beautiful acts of compassion and love, even in the midst of the darkness of this pandemic. Yeah, yeah. Um, you said many things in your chapel service that we'll link to in the show notes, but one of the things that stood out to me goes along with what we're talking about, loving our neighbor. Um, and you quoted Mother Teresa when you said, the circle we put around our family is just too small. Mm-hmm. So as we think about that, what does it mean to love our neighbors just right where we are in our own Calcutta's? Yeah, that 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 idea that when when Jesus says, uh, you know, uh, we're to love beyond our family, he he actually says, you know, um, uh, even the people of the world love their own friends and you know family. Like we're to love bigger than that. He's kind of ex- challenging us to you know extend the circle of whose family. When his you know own family comes, he says, "Who are my my mother and my brothers?" But those who are doing the will of God. So he's really kind of extending how we think of family. And I, I think that's one of the challenges when we think of patriotism or nationalism. You know, it, it's just uh, uh, l- kind of confining our love to the people of our own country that, you know, so much of the language of America first um, mm-hmm. is is 
it's just too short-sighted. You know, I think God's calling us to love big beyond biological family. That's part of what it means to be born again. God's love, you know, calling us to love beyond nationality. And I mean, a love for our own people is a good thing, but love, God's love doesn't stop at borders. You know, God, God's bigger than that. So we're, you know, I think that's, um, Mother Teresa was an example of that. When I was in India, I met young people who were raised by her. And one of them was like oh, wow. 25 years old, 30 years old. And he said, you know what we call her mother, right? And I said, well, I, I, tell me. And he said, she's our mom. <laughs> and, he, and he said, she raised me. And he started showing me things that she had given him, you know, and uh, growing up just like a mom would. And in and, and many of the folks in the orphanage, you know, she found abandoned in train stations uh, as children, folks that she, you know, brought off the street and she took in as her own big family. So she ended up sort of like the old woman in the shoe that had so many kids, she didn't know what to do, you know, like, like that, that, that <laughs> yeah. kind of, uh, but that's why people called her mother, you know, and it, and it does, I think, invite us to think, um, beyond uh, th- those small circles we put around our family. So, you know, taking yeah. in foster kids, taking someone off the streets. I have a friend that's a social worker that was taking care of this older woman with Alzheimer's and they were going to move her into an old folks home. And she, they found a little note that she had written that said, dear God, please don't let me die alone in an old folks home. Oh. <laughs> and they're like, whoa, you know? And yeah. so they ended up taking her in and, I mean, it was, it wasn't easy, you know, her, her mind kind of continued to deteriorate, but they loved her well, even until she died, they were sitting around her bed. And so she didn't die alone. She died with all them around her. So I think some of us, we just need, you know, to, to be invited into thinking about how our lives can be hospitable, how we can, you know, extend that, that love that we've got for our own kids and our own mom and dad, you know, extend that to folks that we're not related to folks that may, you know, even, uh, look different from us because of the color yeah. of our skin or something. Yeah. Um, how do we, how can we, um, as we think about culture and Christianity and sometimes the culture gets so wrapped up within Christianity that it's hard to tell the difference. And one of the things that, or it can be hard to tell the difference. And one of the things that you have said is, uh, we need to give, learn to give Christianity the sniff test. And I really like that phrase. Um, so how can we learn to do that? Like, what does that look like? Well, the, the word Christian means Christ-like. And, you know, that, that's really important that we remember that because there's a lot of things that claim to be Christian, but they don't pass that sniff test, right? They don't smell like yeah. Jesus. Uh, they don't They don't feel like love. We know what love is like. Scripture tells us what love is like, right? Uh, uh, mm-hmm. and, and we know what the fruits of the Spirit, you know, the, the kindness, goodness, gentleness, that's what God is like. So um, that, that, uh, that, that's why, you know, when we um, hear versions of Christianity that don't feel like and sound like and smell like love. Let's not call them Christian. <laughs> you know? uh, <laughs> yeah. it, it was a Gandhi, I, I, you know, that said they asked him about Christianity, and he said, "I love Jesus. I just wish the Christians acted more like him." <laughs> oh, know, yeah. too, too often, you know, we Christians look very unlike our Christ, and so that's that's uh, you know really where at the end of the day, who we're called to follow and to emulate, uh, and. That's, you know, it's where our name Red Letter Christians came from. There was a, this guy that was, uh, catch this, it was in Nashville, Tennessee. He was a, a radio DJ interviewing a friend of mine. And he said, you know, I, I've read a lot of the Bible and the DJ, you know, he didn't really seem to have too much to, to do with Christianity. He said, I've read the Bible. There's parts of it that I love. There's parts of it that I find really confusing, frankly. And yeah. he said, but I've always liked this stuff in red. And he said, you guys oh. seem to like the stuff in red. You should call yourselves red letter Christians. You know, he's talking about the old Bibles that have the words of Jesus highlighted in red. And, but it occurs to me that, that, you know, that that's what we want is a Christianity that looks like Jesus again, that loves like Jesus again. And so that name sort of stuck for, for us, you know, and, and, and yeah. I think that um, for a lot of people, they love Jesus. They uh, just aren't crazy about Christians, you know, or they've not had good experiences with the church. And so I think the best corrective to uh, what's wrong is the practice of something better. You know, as Gandhi said, yeah. be the change you want to see in the world. So we also need to um, take up the invitation to be the change that we want to see in the church. Yeah. Um, 
I like I like that. And I think part of my question is, how do we know what is true? Because it seems like today there is so many versions of the truth. So I find your answer really helpful to figure out kind of what is true when, like I said, there are so many versions of it, it seems, but they're not mm-hmm. all true versions. I understand. But you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, well, and, and you know, Jesus said, "I'm the way, the truth, and the life." And so he is. This is what I think is beautiful about Jesus is that um, we don't just have words on paper; we have the Word become flesh. You know, here is mm-hmm. God with skin on. This is love mm-hmm. in the flesh, and that's who we're really called to follow. Um, and, and so, so Jesus really becomes the lens through which we're reading and interpreting Scripture, and Jesus becomes the lens through which we're understanding how to live in the world. And, mm-hmm. and even when, when scriptures are pitted against each other, Jesus becomes the referee. You know, like in, in yes. the end, Jesus is who God is. You know, that, that's, that's the, 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 the meaning of this kind of idea of incarnation. God con carne, God with meat, with skin on. That, that's what we have in mm-hmm. Jesus. Um, so... And, and it becomes uh, really difficult, for instance, to justify any form of violence with the Prince of Peace. You know, and I think sometimes what we do is we end up interpreting Jesus in light of the Hebrew Scriptures or something Paul wrote, rather than interpreting Paul and the Hebrew Scriptures through the lens of Jesus. You know, so this really mm-hmm. uh, Christ-centered Christianity uh, is is so important. And, you know, that's why I think like so many of the, the big political issues like the death penalty have come from bad theology, Christians that have mm. twisted different scriptures to justify something that seems, I mean, unbelievably contradictory of everything Jesus lived and died for, you know, and even as Christians, I mean, actually Americans were polled, I think it was by Pew, they asked them, would Jesus be for the death penalty. And 95% of Americans said, no, Jesus wouldn't be for the death penalty. Uh, We just have to convince the Christians of that. (laughs) (laughs) And, and, you know, like the fact is that the death penalty has survived in America uh, because of Christians. Uh, 85% of executions are in the Bible Belt. So that that's very troubling. And that's why I got involved yeah. in, in the death penalty, because, you know, it's it's bigger than just one issue. But the the theology, the holes in it that are there. Um, I mean, even just one of the most well-known Bible verses in the world is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Yes. And it, it was this ancient way of understanding justice, one way of thinking about it was that you could do reciprocal harm, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. You could harm someone as much as they had hurt you, but it was really intended not to be a license for revenge, but to put a limit on how much you could hurt someone who had hurt you. So we might think of it as an eye for an eye, no more. You know, if someone poked your eye out, you could poke their eye out, but not both of their eyes. You know, if someone broke your arm, you could break their arm, but you couldn't, you know, break both their arms and burn down their mom's house or whatever, you know, so it put a yeah. limit on that. And so then, you know, in light of that, it, it makes total sense that Jesus, as he's, you know, was not coming to contradict the law, but to fulfill it. And so now he says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you this, you know, and Jesus is going to kind of fulfill that by saying, you may have a right to hurt someone back, but that's, that doesn't mean you should, you know, mm-hmm. like, like we, we don't have to mirror the harm that was done to us. And then he's going to invite us to think deeper, you know, to love even those who have hurt us to transcend their violence without emulating it. And, and, you know, we think like you just step back a little bit and you go, makes total sense, right? Like we don't, like if you, Heidi, bless your heart, if you broke my arm, I wouldn't act, <laughs> actually, I wouldn't actually break your arm, right? If you poked yeah. my eye out, we wouldn't. But we don't rape people who rape to show that rape is wrong. We kind of know deep down that we don't, uh, you know, co- name evil by mirroring the evil. And except, you know, still in the death penalty, we hold out this idea that we're going to kill people to show that killing yeah. is wrong. So, you know, that I think that we just need to do some better theology. The answer to 
kind of this bad, twisted theology is not no theology. It's not to throw the Bible out, but actually to do better theology, I think, and really to do a Christ-centered kind of theology as we're thinking about God. That God, if we want to see God, we look at Jesus. That's exactly why God came in the form of Jesus, so we could we we could know God more deeply. Yeah, yeah. I really appreciate your answer. It's given me a lot to think about. And yeah, I just appreciate that a lot. So thank you. Um, You mentioned while you were talking your work with Red Letter Christians, and I want to go there for just a minute because I think it's important that people know about that as well. So if you could tell us a little bit about what Red Letter Christians is and is up to right now. Yeah, well, we're all about this movement of spreading a Christianity that looks like Jesus again. So it's very clear to me uh, that some of the I love, <laughs> yeah, so, some of the loudest voices, uh, the most public voices, uh, haven't always been the most beautiful voices. You know, they haven't always been the ones that that are the most faithful, and so. Um, the, one of the ways that we change the narrative is by changing the narrators, you know, so we want to amplify uh, all kinds of uh, voices of, of folks that love Jesus and care about things like racism and um, the environment and poverty and, you know, envi- you know, the, the death penalty, these kinds of things. So we, we sometimes say that we're a web of subversive friends. <laughs> and it's a really, di- it's a really diverse group, because I think what we've seen is that there's kind of a version of white evangelicalism that has kind of colonized the narrative uh, of what Christians care about and limit that sometimes to one or two issues. But we, we really want to, um, have a better, uh, uh, you know, a better Christ-centered movement that uh, uh, holds Jesus and justice together like sides of scissors. You know that they yeah. they, they just they go together. And uh, um, so we 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 also sometimes say that we're we're all about harmonizing, but not homogenizing. So you gotcha. know we're, we're as wise as we are diverse. So there's a whole bunch of speakers and leaders. Uh, there's a whole musicians initiative that we've started now. Praise and protest. You know that folks that are worshiping God and are in the streets trying to make change happen. We've got um, revivals that we've had uh, around the country. Some of them are virtual during the pandemic, but yeah, folks can check it out at RedLetterChristians.org. And there's a way to kind of sign up. And we have daily devotionals. We've got uh, all kinds of things that are happening. Uh, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's awesome. become a home for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be sure to link that in the show notes as well. And I want to jump forward. And since we are, we're recording your podcast on October 22nd and it releases on October 27th. So we are right in the midst of election season because it's not just election day this year. It is a whole season of absentee voting, early voting, election day voting. Um, And there's like a lot of, a lot of feelings, a lot of thoughts, a lot of anger, a lot of frustration, a lot of fear, a lot of, a lot of things that I haven't even Mm. mentioned. Um, So as we think about voting as Christians, how can we, or as we think about the season, how can we, how can we put our Christianity into action during this time? Like what is the role of a Christian? Yeah, so I, I think that, that there, it's a tough it's, question, it's, it's huh? Such an important question because I think that that a lot of people immediately go, "Well, we, you know, Christians shouldn't be involved in politics." But I, I think that loving our neighbor requires caring about policies that affect their lives, right? Like, mm. like, like that we, you know, there, there is the heart work, but there's also this social transformation that we want to see. So think about the civil rights movement. Um, no law could change a racist heart. You know, um, mm-hmm. we needed God to change hearts. But it, Dr. King said, no law can make you love me, but it can make it harder for you to kill me. <laughs> you know, uh, and so yeah. we, we can also like you, you, we needed laws to change so that black folks could vote. So people could go to the same uh, schools and swim in the same swimming pools and be treated equally mm-hmm. and fairly. You know, so those, the, like I think in our country. Some of these issues are not just political issues. They are also spiritual issues, right? So, for instance, welcoming the immigrant. This should not be a partisan issue. This is a Jesus issue, right? Jesus said, when you welcome the stranger, you welcome me. Scripture says that when we, you know, take in 
uh, the foreigner, we might be entertaining angels unaware. So this is very holy work. And in fact, Jesus is, is going to say that it, how whatever we do unto uh, the least of these, we do unto him. So so that, that matters in this election. Um, and there are a whole host of issues I think we need to think about as faith issues, you know, and I grew yeah. up thinking about, you know, I, be, talking about being pro-life, but I only thought of that in terms of abortion. And I, I think that abortion does matter. It's one of those issues we should care about. I'm leading a town hall uh, conversation with my friend Lisa Sharon Harper this weekend on abortion. Um, but I began to see that the irony is that in America, you can say that you're pro-life, and still be pro death penalty, pro guns, pro military, anti environment. You know, <laughs> like yeah. uh, you can be against yeah. life in a lot of other forms, but still be you know uh, uh, against abortion. So I think we need a more robust ethic of life that that says every human being is made in the image of God, and it matters to God when lives are cut short. So a hundred lives are lost to gun violence every single day in our country. Uh, when wow. we think of the death penalty, when we think of um, having bombs that are uh, 50 times the size of the Hiroshima bomb, like, like, should we even have that? You know, and the, again, this is not just a partisan thing. Like, like both, both candidates are wanting to raise the military budget, you know? So when Jesus, <laughs> when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, they are the king, you know, they, they are the children of God, that, that matters. It, it should affect how we think about these things. Um, and I, I, so I'm not partisan, but I find that, you know, I wrote a book called Jesus for President uh-huh. because I think when we put all of our chips in with Jesus, um, what that means is that we have a different sort of political imagination. Uh, and it doesn't mean that I'm, I'm not engaged, but it just means that Jesus is my framework for thinking about immigration, for thinking about war, for thinking about everything, right? And and mm-hmm. so I, I think I do think that we're at a particular crossroads in our country. And it's been said that Donald Trump did not change America. He revealed America. Mm, and, interesting. And, and you know, I think the same is true of much of our Christianity. Donald Trump didn't change, you know, evangelicalism, but he's revealed it. And Boy, I so I and I'm I'm very concerned because um, we know who Donald Trump is. I mean, the last you know four, few years have shown us that, and I I um I think that uh, you know he himself has said he could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and still not lose support. So you know I I'm concerned about his rhetoric and his policies. That to me, it's my love for Jesus that causes me to be so deeply concerned about that. So. You know, a tree is known by its fruit, Jesus said, the, you know, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And I'm very concerned about Donald Trump. I think he needs Jesus, you know. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, my friend uh, Sarah Bessie's kid said, we got to remember Donald Trump. God loves Donald Trump, too. But that doesn't mean God wants him to be president. <laughs> so, you know, I, yeah, we can we can say, you know, God loves Donald Trump. Donald Trump needs Jesus. But we we also need to rethink uh, the, the the priorities of what's happening in our country. And um, so, you know, when I think of voting this year, I, I think of, uh, you know, this election is not about who Donald Trump is. It's about who we are and who we want to be as a country. So I think of those. Uh, uh, the the issue of immigration and so many of these other things. And, you know, as I said in chapel this morning, um, I, I want to vote for the people that Jesus blessed. You know, I want to, mm-hmm. I want to, J- Jesus said, blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are the merciful. And as you look at that list, that is a list of people that are currently being crushed by so many of our policies. So I, I'm, you know, really concerned about, uh, our country. And I think there's a lot at stake. I think this is a referendum. And I also think that, you know, there's a racial divide in all of this, that um, as we see, uh, like 80% of white evangelicals have been supportive of Trump. But as you look outside of that, non-white evangelicals uh, and Christians, 80% are not 
supporting Trump. And so we've got this massive wow. racial divide and that becomes really important. So I think all, all that to say, we've got to stay centered on Jesus because when we take our eyes off Jesus, we end up focusing on things Jesus didn't talk a whole lot about. And we don't focus on things that Jesus talked a whole lot about. Yeah. Because I feel like sometimes we can wrap our hope in, in the democratic party or in the Republican party or in whatever party we find ourselves most aligning with and lose the hope that can be found in Jesus. So how can we make sure that our hope is steadfast in Jesus, even as we engage in the culture around us? Yeah. The, the, one of the radical things about the early Christians is that every time they were saying Jesus is Lord, they were saying Caesar is not. And it was about where they put their hope. Uh, we sang that beautiful song this morning in chapel. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. You know, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. So our hope is not in the donkey of the Democrats or the elephant of the GOP, but it's in the Lamb of God. It's in Jesus. Um, and that that becomes uh, you know, so uh, Im- important. And as we think about what it means to follow Jesus right now, um, it, it changes the way that we think about an election so that, you know, when I think about voting, I'm not looking for a savior. You know, I've, I've found my savior. Mm. I'm looking to do damage control. You know, as the scripture <laughs> says, you know, that, that there, this is a battle of principalities and powers. And there are principalities and powers like racism that are hurting so many people right now. And so we've got a chance to do some damage control and harm reduction. <laughs> you know, and, and some, <laughs> yeah. some would say that's cynical, but I think that's a little bit more, um, faithful posture when it comes to politics for us that, you know, but I do think we've got a chance on election day um, to uh, vote with those who are suffering. We can, we can vote for love over hatred. We can vote for faith over fear. We can think of the uh, immigrant families at the border and we can think of those who don't have health care. We can think of Breonna Taylor and the victims of violence as we vote and say, you know, I, I really believe these are the people that Jesus uh, says blessed are in the Beatitudes. And that's who I want to be aligned with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. During this time, it can be easy, or I think it happens a lot on social media. I try to stay out of that area, but um, um, that we we struggle to maintain relationships, especially during this time when we differ. Do you have any thoughts on how to, when we do differ politically or something like that, how we can still maintain a conversation and maintain even family relationships um, right now? Yeah, somebody was telling me this morning they were reading a book. I, I think the title was I Don't Agree With You, But I'm Still Listening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I was thinking what a what a wonderful thing. And I so I, I think for for starters, um I learn as much from people I disagree with as people who say amen to everything we I say, you know, I think that that's what iron sharpening iron, like we're, we, we all see through a glass dimly. So we need to sort of, um, uh, listen well right now. Um, and I think self-righteousness is toxic and it's also nonpartisan, you know, self-righteousness, um, has a lot of different forms that it takes, um, there's kind of a conservative version of that, and there's a liberal version of that. I I, I sort of l- love the story Jesus tells where the one guy goes to pray and, and very pompously stands up and says, thank you that I'm not like these people, you know, and the Pharisee sort of says, thank you that I'm so faithful. And, <laughs> you know, like, and, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, then, and then there's another guy, a tax collector that just beats his chest and says, God have mercy on me, a sinner. And, and that's the posture that we're kind of invited to take. And, and you know, this, this idea that we're, we want to work on our own contradictions and struggles. We want to see our own blind spots. And what often happens is we sort of take the best of ourselves and we compare it with the worst of others. And you end up yeah, with this, sure. this really toxic environment. So um, having said that, I do think that, like, these are really important things and it's okay to be passionate. <laughs> you know, there's a <laughs> lot of lives at stake. You know, uh, we've got yeah. 500 kids that have been separated from their, their families and they, you know, they can't find the parents. I mean, I, I, when we, I believe that when we do that unto them, we do it to Jesus. So I'm very, you know, concerned about these things. And, 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 uh, you know, at the same time, I, I think we can be 
compassionate and still be kind. I think we can um, be folks that are trying to hear other people's perspective. But Dr. King, you know, he talked about the difference between God's peace and the devil's peace. And, you know, there's, there's a version of peace that is just the absence of conflict. And that's what he sort of named as the counterfeit peace, the devil's peace. And but the true peace is the presence of justice. So it's not just the absence mm-hmm. of conflict, but it's it's really you know making sure that justice happens. And so I'm I'm I I do think that we need some good trouble and some holy mischief that we need to <laughs> you know disrupt the status quo right now because there is is so much at stake. Yeah. Um- This is kind of going back to what we talked about earlier, but we keep uh, circling around the issues of race and caring for people who don't look like us, may have different color skin. Um, How can we how can we do that? Well, so one of the things that we've got to recognize, I think, is is there's, uh, you know, a whole there's a whole history of this 400 years of history of, of racism. Um, of, of what we've done to black and brown and indigenous folks as white folks. I mean, our, our country is built on stolen land with stolen labor. And, you know, there's no way that we could have done that without um, forcefully doing it. And, and now you, you think about like some of the these the battle over the Confederate monuments, you know, and mm-hmm. um, um when you when you look at history in other countries like Germany, you don't see monuments to the Nazis. You see monuments to the lives that were crushed by them. Um, you know, after 9-11, we didn't set up monuments to the folks that, uh, you know, uh, blew up the, the, the towers. We, we set up memorials to the lives that were lost. And yet when it comes to our racial history, we've often memorialized the victimizers rather than the victims, right? We, the folks mm-hmm. that were on the wrong side of history. Uh, I mean, in my home state of Tennessee, we still have a statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest, one of the founders of the KKK. It's still in the Capitol, right? So mm-hmm. this is bigger than statues, but they are important because they remind us that we can't get our future right until we get our history right, right? So we've got to mm-hmm. do some hard work on that. And, you know, that still has residue that 400 years of history uh, where We've uh, sold people on corners as property where we've um, we, we've we in the Dred Scott case and so many others like it. We've said black folks don't have any rights that white folks have to acknowledge. And, and so now, you know, we have brothers and sisters that are crying out in the street. Um, I can't breathe. And they're saying, say yeah. with us uh, that our lives matter. And so I, I think that we can't really say all lives matter until we can emphatically say black lives matter, right? Because it, it kind of yeah. helps to heal some of those wounds uh, of history. Um, and and so for, for white folks, I think we've got to really listen uh, to mm. the, 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 the cry of our brothers and st- sisters right now. And it's not that racism got worse. It just got, no. it got recorded. Right. And it got it got it went viral on social media. We have tools today that we didn't used to have. So, you know, when you watch George Floyd have the life crushed out of him for, you know, eight minutes and 46 seconds, people's hearts are broken and they should be. I mean, I would be worried if we weren't out in the streets, Mm -hmm. you know, outraged about that. But you also sort of go, what are all of the other stories of the George Floyds that didn't get recorded? You know, and I think that's what we're kind of being faced with. Um is that in many ways, black folks and white folks are experiencing a very different America, right? And, and, yeah. and, and so when people say things like, make America great again, if we can have the humility to step back as white folks and go, how do I hear that, you know, as, as a person of color? Uh, you know, I, let's imagine an African-American going, what era of American history would I like to revisit? <laughs> you know? mm, yeah, like, is yeah. it the 1920s? Is it the 1950s? Is it the 1800s? You know, so, um, so when many people are saying, make America great again, let there be no mistake. They they mean make America white again. You know, that, that this mm. comes on the back of the changing demographics of America, the first black president, you know, the black lives matter movement. And I think the, the kind of, uh, there, there is this sort of white fear and fragility and anxiety um, 
that uh, it, you know we see it expressed in many different ways. Um, in the you yeah. know folks carrying guns on the Capitol, and you know different language and rhetoric that's used even at the highest places of power in our country. You know the inability to call out white supremacy. So I think those things. The the, 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 the this is massive. I mean, this is a really really important time to be alive. And one of my el- older mentors said, "If you're wondering what you would have been doing in the 1960s with Dr. King." Just look at what you're doing now. Yeah. <laughs> is what you're doing. Yeah. Now, what you're doing now is what you would have been doing then. And you know, Dr. King wrote a, a an entire sermon. Don't sleep through the revolution. You know. So I think this yeah. is the time we we got to make sure that we're awake. Yeah. If people listening want to want to take the first step toward starting to live as if Jesus meant what he said, um, what would you tell them to do? Wow, I'm I'm a big fan of just going back to the Sermon on the Mount and reading yeah. Matthew five through seven and genuinely trying to have you know Jesus said, "Do we have ears to hear and eyes to see?" So just reading it fresh, uh, looking mm-hmm. at the Gospels and seeing how radical that they are, you know, um, and and uh, what does it look like to uh, love our enemies to. Uh, live like the lilies and the sparrows. What is it? Uh, what does it mean that Jesus Himself said, "I didn't come for the healthy, but for the sick." You know, I didn't come for the righteous, but for the sinners. Like that. Like where are our lives? Because that that that's mm-hmm. uh, I think what we're being asked is, what does it mean to follow Jesus? And for me, the entire gravity of the gospel pulls us towards the suffering of the world. And it's very countercultural because mm-hmm. everything in the world is pulling us away from the pain, away from the suffering. Mm-hmm. But the entire story of Jesus is about a God who is moving near to the pain, a God who was born a brown skinned Palestinian Jewish refugee, right? Who came from a town mm-hmm. that people said nothing good could come, who went uh, so far as to be suffer the most torturous humiliation, naked, exposed, humiliated, and hung on a cross to show us what love looks like and to show us uh, and to heal the wounds of sin and violence in the world. So I, you know, I think that that, that, that we've got to really center Jesus again and say, what, what, what does it mean to follow the executed and risen savior? The, the one who um, lived his whole life on the margins. Mm-hmm. How can we organize? Because I'm thinking of myself as I ask this question. Um, and my husband and I just bought a house this spring and we have two cars so that we can go to different places at the same time because we need to do that sometimes. How can we, and I guess I'm thinking other people listening, we probably fit into a pretty pretty much similar categories for some people. How do we organize our households in in the Christian economy to start living as Jesus lived. Wow. One of the things I love when I look at the early church is that when the Holy Spirit fell on them at Pentecost, right? Uh, we often focus on the speaking in tongues and the, you know, the, the fire of the Spirit. But what also happened is they started sharing everything. You know, it says that none of them claimed any of their possessions were their own. It even says that they took the offerings and put at the apostles' feet, put the offerings at the apostles' feet. They were distributed to folks who had need. Um, So that radical sharing was a part of what the Spirit did. And yet we've kind of created this kind of idolatry out of individualism, you know, and independence. And the gospel is all about interdependence. It's about community. It's about living together. and. Jesus models that with us. He sends the disciples out in pairs. He says, where two or three of you are gathered, I'm with you. So I think, you know, we've got to figure out ways that we can share again. Uh, yeah. uh, so I, I was in a, a suburban community where they had, um, they said, you know, not everybody needs a washer and dryer. Not everybody needs a lawnmower. So they had created this co-op and, you know, they had a, a couple of washers and dryers that they all shared as a neighborhood. They had a tool share with, you know, a weed eater and lawnmower that they all shared. And and then before long, they were running summer camps and things like that. I mean, this is all before the pandemic, but I think, you know, there's just yeah. kind of longing for community for that's in us. Um, and, and right now the average American consumes the same amount as 500 people in parts of Africa. And so this idea that we want to love our global neighbor as ourselves, I think it's, it really demands that we find a new, simpler 
way of living because because the world can't sustain the American dream, you know, as we kind of <laughs> have it now. We but the, the Jesus dream is different, right? It's that that we um, every person would have this day our daily bread, you know. So how can we live mm-hmm. uh, into a, a, a different lifestyle that assures that everybody has the things they need? So you know, I, I think there's a lot of different ways it can look, but you know, in, in community in Philly, we've been you know we've got a cars that we've shared with each other. We've got how we've got some of our own property, but we've also got buildings that we share together and community gardens that we share and tools that we share. So I think we've just got got to start thinking outside of the me and, you know, thinking more about the we and how can I live, you know, in, into this bigger sense of community. Yeah, that's awesome. So we have one question that we ask everybody who's on the show, but before we do that, is there anything else you want to talk about that we haven't already? Oh, that's so nice. I was just thinking about, you know, all the folks that get in debt while they're in school, you know, and you, you kind of end up going, oh, I got to go get a job so I can pay off that debt. And I think one of the things that, that I might invite people to think about is rather than figuring out, you know, asking the question, how do I earn more? We can we can ask the question, how can I live off of less? You know, how can I cut my living oh. expenses down? So by living in co-housing or sharing stuff, you know, we can really find more sustainable ways to live. And the other thing I want to say is that I believe in like life and joy and I, I'm having fun. I'm, I'm, you know, <laughs> at what I'm doing. And I don't believe that guilt or shame are very um, constructive things, right? I, Jesus said, yeah. I came that they may have life to the fullest, not guilt to the fullest, right? And I think mm-hmm. that like Jesus is inviting us into a richer, more beautiful way of living. And it's good news to the poor, but it's also good news to folks who aren't, right? It, because yeah, sometimes definitely. our possessions begin to possess us. We kind of hide behind our stuff and we we end up, you know, um, robbing ourselves of the very thing we're made for, which is to love and be loved. And, and, uh, and yeah, so th- the last thing I would say is that, like, I think when we really connect, uh, uh, Frederick Buechner said, we've got to connect our passions to the world's pain. You know, we, mm-hmm. when, when we connect our uh, gifts and our skills to the suffering of the world, then, then I mean, that's where the magic happens. That's where we discover our vocation, right? And the things that we're made for, the things that we're wired to do well, they they are used for a purpose bigger than just paying the bills. They kind of serve this idea that we're, you know, seeking first the kingdom of God. So. I think we should think all think of our lives missionally, right? So like mm-hmm. no matter whether we're a school teacher or a doctor or lawyer, the question is what kind of school teacher yeah. or doctor or lawyer are we going to be? How can we use our gifts to alleviate the suffering to, you know, contribute to the redemptive story of what God's doing in the world? Yeah. I love that. I always love hearing more about how we can think about our calling in the world, more about just more than just what am I going to do, but how am I going to do it? I love that. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, So the last question that we ask everybody, because the show is called the Thrive with Asbury Seminary podcast, what is one practice that is helping you thrive in your life right now? Well, I'm going to tell you this. I, (laughs) my, I think, I think people need to do more circus stuff. So learn to juggle, (laughs) learn to unicycle, stilt walk, just think of how much joy it would bring to the world. Uh, so, um, that, you know, my mentor said, if, if we can't laugh, then the devil's already won. So, so, you know, I think we, we need to keep our joy alive and, uh, that old, that old song, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away. So, but we, <laughs> you know, I'd say do something that makes people smile. Do something that shakes it up. You know, go to class on a pogo stick or something like, <laughs> yeah, like I, just, just mix it up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Well, Shane, I can't tell you how much I have enjoyed this conversation and just really appreciate you taking the time. You too, Heidi. Thanks so much. And I can't wait to come back to Asbury. Thank y'all. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 
Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining me for today's conversation with Shane Claiborne. Just so grateful for him and for his time and for talking to us about what it means to live as if Jesus meant what he said and what that can look like in the 21st century. We talked about a lot of things in today's conversation and whether you agreed or disagreed, I hope this conversation gave you reason to think. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, you can follow us in all the places on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at at Asbury Seminary. Until next time, go do something that helps you thrive.